It's July 2006. This is the audio commentary for the Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2. I'm David Gregory, the director of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Shocking Truth, and I'm here with... Toby Hooper, the director of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre 1 and 2. Sally said she had broken out of a window in hell. The girl babbled a mad tale. A cannibal family in an isolated farmhouse. Chainsawed fingers and bones. Her brother, her friends, hacked up for barbecue. So let's start with a bit of background. You put off making this sequel for a little while, didn't you? Yeah, it was like over ten years. After Chainsaw, the original, uh, was made, I, I think because of the documentary style of it, it was a, a little shocking, even though it was always on the charts and it kept being re-released. There was some reluctance to make the sequel by quite a few studios and, and companies. I think the whole thing was just too shocking to them back then, immediately after the, the original was made. So it found its own, uh, its own place and time, part two did, and, and kind of its own decade that had its own um, political and moral fiber. This film, to me, seems to be a true to that yuppieism kind of, in the way it was promoted, that kind of breakfast club gets all over the USA. Yeah, because the theatrical poster was mimicking the famous breakfast club poster of the 80s yeah. with the Chainsaw family. There's a lot of uh, ironic dark humor in the original film. And I think it was so shocking in, in the 70s that the audiences just didn't see the dark humor. So I decided, I decided to make the dark humor a little darker and stand out a little bit more in this. Incredible production on this. And also meeting a release schedule. So we went through this rather rapidly and... Actually, as the film's being shot, it's still being uh, written and refined. Uh, new sets are being built on, on the spot, like uh, like the front of the whole two-story radio station. I, I couldn't find a place to shoot it, so we just built the facade of it. These guys loved making movies. The Canon guys. Yeah, I mean, they just loved movies. Totally loved cinema. And I feel that's, that this is a, a work of cinema. Here we're showing a bit of a bit of Texas Road, like the same way that you start the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but it's not hippies, it's yuppies. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is obviously, you know, uh, pointing out that we're now in the 80s. What was it about yuppies that you wanted to satirize? Well, it, you know, it wasn't so much as satirizing them as it's just that it's, that's kind of what, uh, that's the, the way life was then. It, to me, symbolized the 80s. Beamer bums, you know. Yeah. And... <laughs> Hook em, pause, baby. We are on our way to the biggest party of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Red River Rock and Roll Request Line. This is Stretch. Now this is Caroline Williams. How did you? Uh, how did you find her? Well, Caroline, I found in, in a uh, in a casting session in Austin when I moved the company to to Austin from LA to start shooting. Some of the casting was done there. From the tip top of the Dallas Fort Worth Metroplex. The actor that plays L. G. Lou Perry was there and an old friend. He was an assistant uh, cameraman, grip, ass assistant, everything on Chainsaw One. <laughs> him. Yeah. yeah, him. And so, and had become an actor and uh, did, did a really splendid job as LG. I had to figure out a way to identify this character for later when there's not much left of him, so you can't identify him visually. Right. So, so I had to give him certain traits and then uh, that's why he has the big LG tattoo. Mm -hmm. But his most identifying trait in this is his uh, coughing up and hacking up and spitting all the time. 
So he even does that when his face is ripped off. <laughs> yeah, he puts the saw down. and Yeah, Leatherface uses a, uh, an electric knife. Hey, check it out, dude. Let's play a little chicken with the farmer here. <laughs> Come on, baby. Come on. Come on. <laughs> And also there was a familiar kind of um, saw, too, as, as, as I recall, on uh, the one sheets, a lot of one sheets and things. It just it was advertised as saw, too. Wasn't that the name that, that it became known as amongst you and the crew while you were making the film? It was just Saw 2 as opposed to, you know, so you didn't have to keep saying the long title the whole yeah, time. Yeah, right, yeah. It was convenient, and, and it sounded good. <laughs> Damn it, I'm trying, darling. Don't call me darling, damn it. Now, the difference between these guys and Marilyn Burns and co. in the original is that they are so obnoxious and annoying, you, you are dying for them to die. <laughs> <laughs> that seemed to be happening in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> This is the facade that, that we built. I thought, you know, okay. Well, I mean, that is, uh, I had to have that set in a week, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is in the inside of the, uh, the studio we used. is the inside of, of the old Austin Statesman building that was the uh, local newspaper for, I don't know, many, many, many years. And um, they moved to a new location, and there was this big sound stage like uh, uh, building left over with lots and lots of offices the pit where they had all of the you know the newspaper pressing machines and so later that became the inside of the lair hang it up lame -o. go call your mother <laughs> dirty well this is for rick the pit <laughs> he wants to hear carrie white this production designer is a it's a world-class production designer and uh, who just like happens to live in austin because it's a cool place to live Mm -hmm. I'm particularly happy with all the set dressing and and, and the performances and the uh, uh, kind of bizarre, ludicrous uh, behavior that the characters have. Fuck! Are you crazy? Back up, big fucker! This scene, I think, took about a week of night shooting to get all of these shots. And it's made up of this and the post this, which is the crashed Mercedes, it was made up of more than one bridge, a daytime bridge and a nighttime bridge. Mm -hmm. We totally flattened a couple of these, uh, these little cars. What the hell is that? Look at some, some the geek! Out. The geek's got a... Come on, what is that? <laughs> Come on, get out of here! Where did he come from? So this uh, is the hitchhiker uh, uh, body. Nubbins. Nubbins. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. That's what they call him. Uh, nubbins. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I have. I have nubbins. Oh, you do? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I do. Yes. He's uh, quite a conversation piece. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. I mean, this is quite just a bizarre idea to have him sort of strapped as a puppet to the front of uh, Leatherface. Yeah. Well, well, what do you, you know? What it is is it is the um, the hitchhiker, mm -hmm. you know, that's run over by the the big cattle truck yep. from uh, part one, and his twin brother was in uh, in Vietnam during Ch Chainsaw One. Right. So the the birthmarks on the other side of the face, all the other features, they're on the. You know, but they, but the, these this chainsaw family, uh, you know, ha, has a way of keeping their loved ones around. Yeah, yeah, They're very close, very <laughs> tight. The bus saw. Bus saw. Hey, hang up, man. Hang up. 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 Yeah. Shoot the bastard. Well, this seemed to take forever to shoot. <laughs> So you also uh, were about to see a bit of uh, uh, gore in this uh, we're, we're, scene. We're going to see some Tom Savini anatomical correctness coming up. 
<laughs> I mean, we decided, oh, hell, just go for it, you know, and um, hopefully we'll get uh, an R rating. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> was it difficult to shoot around effects like like these? Well, yeah, it was. It was just hard to shoot. Yeah, I mean, it was d difficult to shoot that. That was like a, a, a stunt and an effect because I mean that obviously wasn't the driver's head and hands. Yeah. But that was the driver's seat. Wow, well, they just cut off. So did you make a, a conscious decision then that, okay, we, we uh, held back on the extreme violence in the original in order to differentiate ourselves, let's go all out and, and go for the gore in this one? After the original, and, and the original, uh, you know, was not that, there was not that much gore on screen, and a lot of it happens in your imagination. The 80s, too, I mean, played a big part of showing the gore because between the uh, middle 70s and uh, the 80s when this was made the films had gotten extraordinarily graphic i mean heads were flying i mean, I mean it, it seemed like that if you didn't uh, have gore in a film that was the genre film that it uh, they didn't like it mm -hmm. tom and i thought well let's let's talk about this and uh, give them something they haven't seen before and savini was more than uh, inventive <laughs> and, and coming up with some some very very good bizarre and gory uh, details you get out of there cowboy get away from there this is an accident scene the air is restricted i'm not going to tell sorry, you again it's all right it's all right Wendell. Lieutenant Enright, sir. We heard you might be headed this way. Uh, did you come over for the big game? You know why I'm here. And of course, this is Dennis Hopper as Lefty Enright. Yeah, Dennis, yes. How did you get Dennis involved? Uh, I, I asked Dennis. I, I was getting ready to um, cast the film, and I was in a restaurant. Um, and uh, Dennis was in the restaurant, and I walked over and asked him if he would consider doing the film. He said, he said, let him think about it. And then so we talked in a few days and, and made the deal. <laughs> Hell. Hell's exactly what they raised. I think Dennis enjoyed quite a lot of this. Yeah. Well, this was, uh, this was a good period for him because he, after his few years in the wilderness, shall we say, you know, this was around the time he did Blue Velvet and yes. uh, got nominated for an Academy Award, so... And then, yeah, yeah, there was some, yeah, big film after Blue Velvet. Yeah, he did get it. Was it Hoosiers? Yeah, that was it, Hoosiers, yeah, yeah. Riot. You know what riot means? You were a ranger. Can't hardly keep them down by law, and if, if you go around promoting this chainsaw... Trying to speak plain. Saves time. There was a backstory in this that, um, where Dennis, uh, lefty and right, um, years and years before this film before this story begins, he his backstory. He had a relationship with this uh, with this woman, and she got pregnant, and then that became Stretch, the Caroline Williams part. Mm -hmm. So she never knows that in in this, but the backstory is uh, is all there that there is this re definite relationship and protection going on. And that's why he says, Franklin, they got you too. I mean, they. Uh, he was familiar with all those people when uh, the Caroline William when Stretch was uh, very small. So she essentially is related to the to Sally and Franklin from, from well, well, the first film. Yes, but I uh, yes, but I don't know exactly know what that relationship is. Wazos. Remember the Alamo old cowboy. <laughs> That's, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I got to throw my Dr. Pepper camp. <laughs> Asshole. You need a witness? I'm a witness. 
So was it th- this part of the film where you were, where you would have given that backstory between Dennis? Uh, no, it was much later. It was much later in the film. Mm-hmm. Dennis, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, Lefty and Wright had had a really bad night of uh, before this sequence, the backstory, the sequence of uh, drinking mezcal, e- even eating the worm, mm-hmm. and uh, chainsaws coming out of the walls and such as that. He was great. I mean, he would uh, before action on these shots he would uh, spin and spin until he was totally disoriented so when i said action he he was he was quite wonderful to work with um you're just a joke in this morning's paper uh, cowboy chases chainsaws 14 years dallas police refuse comment like you're you know hung up on on something crazy but i believe you i might be the only believer you got because it's right here what is? Right on here, those kids getting killed. Now, this is evidence, sort of, right? Caroline was just uh, unbelievable at, uh, that, you know, that she was just kind of in Austin waiting to be in this movie, in a way. I mean, it's, uh, it's was uh, bizarre finding her and that, I, you know, I didn't have to bring an uh, actress from Los Angeles. Because the original had, had kind of entered into into legend in the Austin area, I think, hadn't it, by this time? Y- yeah. You know, all the stories around its making, in addition to the fact that it was obviously a huge success for an independent film. Yeah. Like the bridge sequence that uh, that we just saw, my gosh. Uh, the, the, the bridge was um, blocked off, and uh, there was a young man that really wanted to get over into the little town where the camp was, and I had to stop shooting on the bridge scene because we had to go under the bridge to rescue him. He was climbing underneath the bridge, hand over hand, hanging onto pipes and things, and trying to spider his way. <laughs> we found him and said, hey, come on. Come over here and watch this. I ain't got no fear, Lord. <laughs> What about this French fry house? Yeah. Do <laughs> people do that? <laughs> oh, I don't think so. <laughs> no, no. I mean, LG would. Yeah. And, and, and did. <laughs> Hard ass. Hard ass? Me? And this is where yeah. we get to see, for the first time, we get to see a member of the Chainsaw family actually interacting with other members of society. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes. The award-winning chili cook-off. What, Norma? Oh, well, gee. What made you want to actually show the cook uh, in his kind of day-to-day life, take him out of... uh, out of the environment we've seen him in and in, into a much more normal environment. Well, he was actually the only one of the lot that was presentable enough to be in public. And, and, and of course, he did interact with public at his little uh, uh, his gas, station. gas station and, uh, and barbecue stand. Austin? Uh-uh. He's Dallas's favorite caterer. And I think he's kind of cute. The last round of Rolling Grill chef, Drayton Sawyer! get to put him in a little suit as well yeah the little suit yeah <laughs> and accepting the award he uh, would uh, lean the <laughs> the little bowl of chili over onto the suit and, I, and and the oil and grease would start running down i only had i think i only had three costume changes for jim in this sequence got to tell the secret of that fabulously tasty chili <laughs> no secret it's the meat. Uh, don't skimp on the meat. Uh, Can you tell me a bit about Jim in general? Uh, you know how you how you first yeah. met him because he was the only professional actor in the, y- yes. the original, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I was in a film. Uh, I've forgotten the title of it, but it's, uh, it was a film about motorcycles and uh, in Texas. And he was in it, and I that's that's where I met him. And he was a uh, a member of uh, the Alley Theater that was a a quite respected uh, theater company in Houston and um, this this guy was, was a wicked Shakespearean actor his King Lear was un- unreal 
Mm-hmm. And, and he and he just seemed to have that weird. I mean, it's just it's just he understood this. He understood the the ironic humor. He understood this character. Now, I seem to remember you have a story about how, when you first came up with the idea of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you were in a store and there was a wall full of chainsaws. Is this particular scene inspired by that in any way, this chainsaw store? No, I don't think it is, no, no. This store, the last I saw it, I was in Austin three or four years ago, and they still have that uh, that Cartwright uh, chainsaw sign up no, it was an actual ch- uh, story that you buy chainsaws from. Uh-huh. And, um, I mean, it's just sitting there, and it was like, you know, wow, wow what could be better than this? <laughs> it's total natural. It even had the, uh, uh, unless Carrie put them out there, and I was unaware of it, but it had the logs out in front that they test the chainsaws on. And a stuntman did some of the uh, chopping into the... Uh, the logs with a chainsaw because I don't think anyone you know knew what would happen if a chainsaw blade actually broke and came flying off how many heads would go rolling so you're gonna find out <laughs> yeah yeah we're going and and you know and uh, nothing happened you know and then also there's a chainsaw fight later in this film too and uh, the teeth had to be taken down but the the, uh, when the chains hit, they would actually spark. You know? mm-hmm. They just did some beautiful things. Yeah, it really seems like Dennis is having some fun with this. Yeah. Role. <laughs> they both. It was a local actor that's been in so many. Um, so many Texas films or films made in Texas. I think he was even in, in Close Encounters. Mm-hmm. Not that that was made in Texas. Get them suckers a time or two. So can you tell me a bit about the writing of this film? Uh, getting Kit Carson and... Uh and how you approached it with him. I had worked with Kit on um, on another script, and um, and I, I, I liked his work, I liked his sense of humor. I, I also had a deadline to meet, um, and that was to get this picture on the screen as soon as possible. And Kit really connected with it, and... Um, and Kit is also uh, from Texas, and he understands, uh, you know, he understands some of the blood that makes up the mindset. So he became uh, like a natural for it. And then uh, I thought his humor was quite good, and we were constantly working on the scene. Kit worked with this little tiny typewriter that he uh, put under his arm, and, uh, you know, like one of the old journalist kind of little teeny tiny typer. Yeah. Often he would be typing and we would be talking and, and the pages would come straight out of that typewriter to the actor. That happened in uh, Bill Mosley's character a lot because we constantly we found what's funny about that. Oh, you want to hear it now. And uh, continued to uh, embellish that, in particular in the radio station. I don't think it'd be legal to do that. FCC regulations. Because it seemed like an interesting transition after Paris, Texas, for uh, for Kit to do, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. But then, also, uh, it seems like he he's done that in his career. He wants to do what's not expected of him, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Kit's always been been that way. Kit is quite good. He's a good actor as well. Mm-hmm. Actually, I should have really put Kit in this film somewhere. 
<laughs> what would you have had missed? I don't know. <laughs> together as murder. They call it accidents, disappearances. You got that last slaughter on tape. You play it on the radio. Maybe then the laws will stop trying to shut me up and start helping me. Besides, give you something real to do. You said you were going to do this alone. I need your help, Missy. Well, you can call me Stretch, Mr. Enright. Well, now, you can call me Lefty. It's mighty nice doing business with you. Thanks. Weren't you originally going to be the producer on this, yeah, nice and then you know. became the director at a, at a later stage? Yes, that's that that is right. I met with uh, quite a few of the town's uh, young genre directors uh, at the time, and no one would take it on. They were very career conscious, and they thought, well, you know, if they took this on and and it didn't work, it would not look, you know, it wouldn't work for them. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I, I simply couldn't find anyone. And so uh, I decided, well, okay, I'll, I'll go back into that world again. And uh, this time I think I'll enjoy myself. Because you didn't think that people actually s saw the humor in the first one, but there was a lot of humor in the first one. Y yeah, that's, uh, yeah, after like uh, eight years or ten years or something like that, uh, the dark comedy seemed to... You know, started popping out like, you know, like, look what your brother's done to the door and all of those uh, calls on morals and uh, family behavior. So I was disappointed uh, at first that they didn't see that. Uh, so I decided to make sure that it was visible in this. Ah, last round up rolling grill. We're, we're still number one. I told you, boys, and I told you, don't call on this phone, now, damn it. Get off. What's on the radio? Ah, now don't bullshit me. I can't. I, I won't. All right, what station? This ain't no joke, boy. Tune into that. That's fair, dude. You, you, you've done it again. Ah, you cool shit. Ah, you butt crackers, you'll be the death of me yet. Ah, ah. But he's still essentially playing the same character it, it, because it, when he's as when he was saying, I, you know, look what your brother did to the door. It, yeah, he's doing the same thing here. Yeah, he is. And were Canon the first studio then that wanted to actually roll the dice and actually take on this uh, holy grail, shall we say? Well, I, I yeah, I had a um, I had a three picture deal with them and this was the third of the uh, the three films and uh, to get this film green lit kit and I into the Canon building then we came out a, I would say a, maybe three minutes later with a green light <laughs> set on our way to to go do it without a script and at first we didn't exactly know where we were going except this family still exists in texas and um and hasn't been caught so now that we're in the uh, the croissant business with barbecue <laughs> selling to the yuppies before the big football sure games a lot of complaints darling lg it was a request right it's listed in the logs as a request. People complain about the request every night, right? Uh-huh. It's set during, during a time to in Texas, between the Texas-Oklahoma game that's a really big draw for football fans and uh, people do I mean kids have to, you know check into hotels and throw chairs through windows and so there's quite you know, almost like uh, soccer player fans yeah around this time and in this early part of the film though you did show a bit more of that uh, or intend to show a bit more of that in the in the original script didn't you? yeah surely did yes 
Yeah, but it just sometimes things just don't work out. Uh, hopefully, always a film ends up being what it is meant to be because, you know, halfway through it, if you're shooting it on a sequence, it takes over and starts to tell you what it what it needs to fill in the dots. Right. But some of those shots, like the one with Joe Bob Briggs, they, they, were, they were actually shot. Oh, yeah, they, yeah. But there wasn't, uh, in that line of thought, there wasn't enough to complete it and to uh, sew it into the film. Yeah, I forgot the Joe Bob Briggs scene in it. Which I think took place in an underground car park or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, or a staircase or in in the park or something like that. I left the body a mess. You can get away with murder out here. Did you ever know how to catch? Lefty? I think we're going to see a murder here in a moment (laughs) that goes on for some time. And we're about to be introduced to Bill Mosley's character, Chop Top. Now, in the original script, was Chop Top going to be the hitchhiker, or was there always going to be an individual character called Chop Top? Yes, there was always going to be an original character uh, called Chop Top. I think it was uh, that it shifted to his twin brother and not him at, mm-hmm. at some, some point during uh, pre-production. Yeah, because I seem to remember you telling me that, that originally you, you, you wanted to reprise Ed Neal's role, but for one reason or another it didn't work out. It, it didn't, uh, didn't happen. This coat hanger has gotten a lot of, uh, has been the subject of a lot of discussions with my uh, director friends over the years. Oh, yeah? (laughs) Yeah, no, they love the coat hanger. Bill Mosley still has the actual coat hanger. Oh, he does? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's great. And the teeth. Oh, yes, yeah. Oh, yes, that's right. (laughs) I've seen the teeth, yeah. I've seen him in recent years with those teeth. Have Actually, you? yes. <laughs> Can't close that. Hi, I know what you're thinking. This is weird, huh? But I can handle it. <laughs> you know. You're my fave. <laughs> me and Bubba. So, can you tell me about the development of of this character? Obviously, you know he's he's back from Vietnam. He's got a plate in his head. Right, and he was uh, chopped with a you know, machete, cut a piece of his head off, and now he's getting checks from the government as well as he his own little uh, business here. <laughs> and um, it was really interesting the way uh, I found Bill. I was. Um, either shooting or in prep on Poltergeist and I got a a beta tape that came to my office in the mail and the title on it was the Texas Chainsaw Manicure and it was a little film that Bill Mosley made where he played the hitchhiker and um, and so I um, I thought well god you know he's doing a great job this is a great it's even more than an impersonation of the guy, it, it is a character that embodies uh, this this uh, hitchhiker that he's doing. When he was cast, I'd never met Bill Mosley. I just said, oh, well, you know, did great, go get him. Tom Savini had already shaved his head, and um, and he was part of the way into his makeup, in, into the casting of his makeup, or into the, he was sitting in a makeup chair. I don't know if he had a cast on or not. He, couldn't have because he he recalls seeing me and I walked in smoking a cigar and we shook hands and then the next thing he knew he was on the set. The <laughs> and there's the exit sign to Rajabra. Uh, T. Exit. 
And how much of this is, uh, is, I mean, was the character this outrageous when it started or did it become more and more outrageous it, as the show went on? It became more and more outrageous. As the character started to reveal itself, I could see in the character and in, and in the performer, you know, the, um, a very good stage to place all of these other things that I wanted to play with theatrically and, uh, and, and bizarre, twisted, comedic uh, arena. You know, <laughs> that lefty request record that, that you, you honked out today? I love that. Yeah, as soon as Bill understood, I mean, he totally twigged this, uh, this coat hanger. And, and the moment he understood it, you see, um, see this heating process, the sterilization of the end of it. Well, if he's lucky and he's just hits just the right spot, the skin is loose. He, he tries to keep the skin from adhering to the plate altogether because he's discovered that if he can, there's a little spot just under the plate that if he gets that heated coat hanger, touches this little area of his brain, he instantly gets off. <laughs> and, so, and so that's his, uh, you could call it a sex toy, actually. For yeah. What's in here? Record vault. Oh, where you keep the golden oldies and uh, and maybe uh, maybe the new music. That was the dodgy effect. <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about the Leatherface mask? Um, yes. It, it's, it's a little bit different than how it is in the first one. The first one's, you know, it's a bit more raw. And obviously Tom Savini has, uh, has made it more like, you know, several faces stitched together. Right. Uh, did you discuss with Tom how you wanted the Leatherface face to look? Yeah, yes, I did. Yeah, the, the original um, is, um, is quite scary, I must say. It's a, uh, like, parchment but yeah, I wanted an, uh, an ear visible, you know, somewhere in the neck, I think. I wanted extra, you know, faces sewn together, actually, to create a face, stitched together with several faces. Uh, oh, oh, he's gonna send me back to the VA hospital with a dent in my plate. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <This, laughs> he's, he's a filthy, <laughs> Filthy creature, this. Well, at least you didn't mess me up. <laughs> dog will hunt! Get that bitch! Leatherface, get that bitch! And all his sayings like dog will hunt. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, that were these things that, that came up as the show was going on, or was that, that stuff that was, was already in there? He's got so many catchphrases. Yeah, I think dog will hunt. I think that's a Kit Carson... A uh, phrase that Kit, I think, had used in, in shall we say, uh, real life. <laughs> but uh, I can't remember. It's like uh, music is my life and... Um, lick my plate, you oh, dog oh, dick. Oh, yeah, is yeah, yeah. A particular <laughs> yeah, favorite. Lick, lick, yeah, lick my plate, you dog dick. Yeah, that, that is a, that's a great line. <laughs> music is my life! And what about Bill Johnson, uh, who, who was your leather face? Hey? Yeah, Bill, Bill was in Texas, and uh, quite a good actor. Bill has been in several films, uh, probably more, more films than I know of. I mean, he was in um, the remake of um, DOA that had just been shot in Austin. <laughs> Blue uh, has worked on and off for a long time. He was in uh, The Sheriff uh, in uh, Boys Don't Cry. He, he's a, a total 
good vibe contribution to this to this this world and, and I was really happy with uh, with Lou in this film hey, lick my plate you dog dick what the <laughs> fuck you think you're doing in here you crazy looking little son of a bitch get out of here <laughs> Here you really establish that, okay, the killings in this are going to be extreme. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you've got a little joke in there. He spits a loogie. It, yes, he does. <laughs> and he gets hit over the head with the hammer I don't know how many times. Uh, it looks like hundreds of times. Yep. I, mean. I remember watching this with my sister when I can't remember what age I was, but I was quite young. And she was just going, oh, no, oh, no, and he's the, not again. And it just did not stop. Yeah, and it keeps going. Which well, I thought was great. Yeah, it was kind of um, like this is one hell of a uh, hard guy to punch his lights out. <laughs> yeah, particularly as he's still alive later in the film. <laughs> yeah, right. That was another thing as well. You have Leatherface doing kind of a little dance uh, quite a lot in, in, in this film. He holds the chainsaw above his head and he does a little yeah, a little dance. Is that kind of a, a throwback to the last scene in the original? Oh, film? yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, you, you, you know, if you uh, start playing around with a chainsaw, you find yourself, that's that, that's about, you can either do one or two things with it, and that's dance with it or, you know, or cut something with it. <laughs> yep. This saw he's using, I have this saw at home, and it's 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 quite heavy. You're gonna have a little little bit of almost a chainsaw rape here. I mean, as much. So. Yeah, you definitely add a, a sexual element to, to Leatherface's <laughs> character in this as well, which is a heterosexual element when you consider yeah. that, you know, it was very ambiguous. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, well, you can see throughout this film is he gets really turned on to this <laughs> this girl. He doesn't quite know how what to do with those feelings. I, I mean, he, he's uh, very, very much, uh, you know, a part of the, the f uh, family. I mean, family is uh, so important. In, in this tribe, and um, he has a total dilemma. He doesn't exactly know what to do with her and these feelings. And he's getting some new feelings here I think, that, that um, he just hasn't experienced before. And she's playing up to uh, it. Oh, yeah, I mean, she, she's, she's teaching him new things uh, without uh, knowing that she is. How good are you? Huh? Yeah, I think in some way here she she uh, uh, sparks to uh, being able to control him. You also, you know, make it make it very clear, um, obviously, that the the chainsaw is a phallic symbol, which you know became. You became a part of film criticism in the 80s about horror movies and the fact that the knife or whatever it was that the guy chasing the woman was was you know it was basically right right it was basically the rape <laughs> and so you're making it quite quite obvious here. yeah yeah yes no i'd i'd, I'd already uh, read all of those things yeah and in particular uh, about the knife tall buildings and all of that you know. yeah <laughs> are you really Really? Good? Yeah, he just doesn't know how to deal with this uh, strange proposal. Really good. You're really good. Can you talk a little bit about the, the contrast uh, of 
the production of this film versus the first one because this was a pretty big budget film wasn't it yeah. the first one obviously was micro budget yeah yeah um would you say you know you had more luxury because you had more more money on this film or the, does it bring with it you know hardships no matter what well it, it brings hardships but then again making films is uh it brings hardships anyway i mean no matter you know under the best of conditions it's almost impossible to make a film there's so many details in each and every shot and there's so much going on uh in the circus camp that y you're unaware of too as a director because uh, you know my mind is uh, uh directing is always focused on you know this moment and 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 through a, a particular 35 millimeter aperture that's in space acting as a proscenium but what goes on in the circus is like sometimes a unreal all kind of plots going on back there where, where the Winnebago's are Letterface! <laughs> Did you get her, Bubba? Did you get that bitch? <laughs> She, she was my favorite, but she knew, <laughs> and now nobody knows. <laughs> what size crew did you have on this film versus on the original, for example? Oh, I don't know. It was it was uh, huge. I mean, there was a, the original film. Everything could fit into, um, say, a, a truck the size of the truck that was uh, uh, the van that was the van in the film. Uh, in the original film, and are two of them. In fact, uh, the van in the film, uh, the original film that we used, was one of the transportation vans. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, parenthetically on this, uh, that uh, was totaled two or three days after the production of the original film because it it, it, it ran into a cow going <laughs> <laughs> going at something like 40 miles an hour. But, I mean, this was like trucks and trucks and trailers and... Uh, uh, you know, hundreds of people. And was it all shot in Austin, the studio stuff as well? The Texas Battleground was shot about uh, th 30 miles outside Austin, something like that. But yes, yes, it was all, all and, and right down to the last insert was shot there. God damn it, Lefty, you're late! The three films that you made for Canon were Invaders from Mars, Life Force, and this. And this, yes. Was this one lower budget than the other two, or they, were they all pretty much the same? This was less expensive than Life Force. I don't know by what, because I, one thing I've definitely learned is that, um, you know, you, you hear numbers that become just that, numbers. I mean, you, you know, I, I, I don't know what's really spent. You know, I, I know how many days I put in, I know how many hours a day I work, but as, as far as the, what something costs, I'm not, not entirely sure. Can you talk a bit about this set and you know how it's the new abode of the uh, of the Chainsaw yeah, family? Yeah, yeah. Well, as as they um, as the eighties approached and they got uh, more affluent with with their barbecue business, they opened this little Texas battleground. There was a little amusement park that played out, kind of didn't work, but they keep taking their uh, like the distribution of their fine barbecued uh, product uh, goes to. Uh, cities like Dallas, Houston, Austin, and so um, their lair is is here at the remains of this uh, Texas battleground. This was outside Austin, an actual little kind of theme park that had been um, more than one times. This this place has been run over by a tornado. Th those heavy iron uh, curved arches. 
at the other end of the lot of those things. It was all twisted and mangled where, where a tornado came through. And it may have been this very night, um, or certainly one of these nights of shooting at this. And, and a lot of shooting was done here. It, it was one of those nights where the, the lightning in Texas is like, you know, to the left it lightnings, to the right, to the front, to the rear, and it's like, uh, you know, one, a strike every second, second and a half. Uh, the wind picks up and the battlefield sign blew off the mountains. And uh, and, and I was in my, my trailer studying for the next shot. And the damn trailer was shaking and rocking. And um, then uh, uh, Laura Kouris, who uh, was the uh, script supervisor, and Richard Kouris was the DP of, of this, her husband. She came to me and she was... Uh, and, and, and I'd been out of Texas for a long time, and I'd forgotten s some of the tornado fear. And, uh, and she said, you know, this is really, really, really bad to be here tonight. And, you know, and the, and the trailer was almost like on a gimbal. You know, the wind was hitting it. And, and then we'd re heard the report that um, a tornado not far from here, I mean, I'm talking about like two miles, a mile, a uh, they counted the next day that it had gone down into a herd of cattle and picked up about 40 or 50 cows and threw them, flung them for miles. And and so uh, this it's it quite, quite an evening, of, uh, an electrical storm that, you know, I, I would pay a hundred bucks to see. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just fantastic. <laughs> So basically, the the Chainsaw family, though they came into the uh, Texas battleground after it had closed down. Yeah, 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 yeah. And was this all created, or was this part of actually there? That was that part was actually there. The statues, uh, God, I have no idea where where Carrie found them, but they were brought in. The oh, interior, there may be some of the tunnels. I believe it was the, uh, used for the interior. Some of those uh, metal archways that. I think we covered, put uh, uh, foam on the inside to make it look like rock. Did you also want to kind of take it away from the realm of reality once you go into the underground here? Because because the first one was so well known for its realism and, uh, and that kind of thing. Yeah, well, it, the, you know, from the fr from the very beginning of this, it started uh, demanding its own uh, look mm -hmm. and its own, its, and, and and I think that came out of out of character behavior because that, that's really where I start with a film, is not so much the look of it, but character and behavior. <laughs> I had the gut wall in. Tom Savini did not spend all uh, his time making those. That was, that was a uh, um, almost certain a rendering plant uh, operation.
Now, you were saying you, uh, you were working on a very tight deadline on this film. Were you able to get it all done in time, or did you have to, uh, did you have to make certain compromises? Or? It doesn't look like there's any compromises from watching the film. Mm. I mean, I, I just don't recall. I, I know the deadline, the deadline wasn't so much a shooting deadline, uh, though, as it was a deadline for distribution, a distribution window that I had to make. And were the were the Canon people uh, heavily involved in the production, or did they generally leave you alone? They pretty much left me alone. There was a moment of uh, kind of intrigue towards the end of uh, of shooting, but um, I've seen much worse. Really, not quite enough to talk about. <gasps> Smokehouse is entirely made of human skulls. Hogs on the grill. A big, big pregame brunch tomorrow means a ton of croissant sandwiches. Oh, oh I love this town. Hey, you nitwit back in here, get the grill on. Was Jim happy to come back then and oh, reprise the role? Yeah, very happy. Yeah, he, he was absolutely delighted. Because even when I, I uh, uh, interviewed him years later, he was still very, very proud to be associated yeah. with both of these films. Yeah, he's, he, he was just great. <laughs> William Hooper, my son, uh, made a lot of the bone furniture, and um, he was in the art department. On this one, he made some of the some, some of the tools, some of the. Uh, I think there's a, a cleaver coming up here pretty soon. You know, a meat cleaver that has a some kind of bone handle. But there, there, there's some, actually some elaborate artwork towards the end of this film, what with with skulls and various bones. And some of Tom's. Yeah, Tom was quite Tom. The, the the superstar for doing this kind of thing. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, oh, Tom. Tom. yeah, yes. Tom had a um, learned what the inside of a human body looks like in the most unfortunate way. I think you know, he certainly knew. And how would you work with Tom? Would you uh, did you discuss what it was you wanted at the beginning of the film and say, okay, have at it. I know what you're doing. Yeah, I said go for it. It seems that I remember just saying, you know, I mean, let's go for it and get an R rating. But um, but there were like you know Friday the Thirteenth and uh, and and there there was quite a lot of bloodletting uh, in movies um, in in this decade. Did you have run-ins with the MPAA on this film? No, they just simply wouldn't rate it. <laughs> I mean, there was no run-in. They would just say, they just simply said, uh, "Hey, I mean, this one you just forget about it. The only uh, way you can cut enough out of this movie uh, to satisfy us is to uh, put it in a can and, and put it in a closet somewhere. You know, <laughs> the title sequence, maybe." <laughs> So how did that go down with, with, with Canon or whoever was distributing it? Because were you required to deliver an R-rated movie? No, oh, no, okay. no. You know, you, you, you hope for an R, and um, I was surprised that it uh, was either NC-17 or X, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it was pre-NC-17, yeah. so it would have been unrated. Y yeah. yeah, yeah. And so they, they preferred to just go out unrated than... Um, put an X on it and um, and that's a severe thing to do to a movie too it um, it limited um, how they could publicize the film and um, television spots and, uh, a lot of newspapers wouldn't run ads but do you think that actually ultimately harmed the uh, the box office potential of the film or do you think that actually added to it for the horror fans yeah I think really the hardcore fans it, it would have added to it 
it's hard to say. Mm-hmm. That and and in that it, it's this really surreal black comedy. I think probably the mainstream audience expected more of the same, you know, like from the original film, the uh, you know, startles and chair jumpers and deeply disturbing, dis- disturbing in a different way. Put that down. Who is that? Is it wet? It's wet. Put it down. How did Caroline handle things such as having LG's uh, face put onto her face? I remember Caroline really going with the moment and not having... She only, she only had a, cu- a couple of problems, I think, uh, as I recall. And one may have been... I'm not even sure. I don't even recall what it was, but not this scene. But then again, you know, I mean, to, just to clean up the mess after each take on this, you know, would have been enough to uh, be problematic. I suppose one of the inevitable questions is uh, why you didn't bring back Gunnar Hansen as as Leatherface. Was it because he was no longer in the business? No, I, you know, I don't know. I, re- I really, I really don't know. Maybe it's because he li- he didn't live there anymore, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, or it could have been that I was out of touch with him. I'm not sure. see the tattoo well then you're definitely going to see the loogie (laughs) (laughs) this is an amazing piece of makeup i've never actually seen it so clear before yeah uh, yeah vhs copies it you can't see all the detail but i think fangoria published a poster of it where it was a real close-up so you can see all the details yeah yeah. no you can (laughs) It, it it's pretty amazing what Tom did because when the mask comes off, it it really you know it really fits like a puzzle piece and back to his poor face. <laughs> God. He's he's way messed up. <laughs> he's nuts. He, he said in a, a Lou Perryman said in a recent interview that uh, that he thought it was strange that that Leatherface would have left his boxes on. When he was uh, when he was skinning him alive, <laughs> so he offered to do it butt naked. But <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was even too much for this film. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I still had hopes of getting a, a rating. You know, yeah. <laughs> while I was shooting, I, I, I'd forgotten that. But um, yeah, I mean, he would have. I mean, Lou is totally dedicated to this. <laughs> So how did the film actually end up doing when it came out? It did kind of okay. It did great on video. 
you know, I, I, as I recall, it's went double platinum on on video, but I have no idea how many screens. It, it was a fairly wide release, as I recall, for then. You know, it's not it's not like today's uh, four thousand theater releases, but it, it was prob probably I don't know twelve hundred theaters, maybe something like that. And then you know the the hardcore genre fans went, and then word of mouth finally prepared you for the differences between the two films. And it's taken actually a, a, a long time to see the film as a kind of separate, kind of a relative of the first film. This surreal, uh, expensive, and I say that expensive too, talking about the uh, the eighties and. Uh, the metaphors of the 80s that this film has in it. Because, of course, now it has a lot of fans, you know, w would have seen at the time that there was a certain amount of disappointment, you know, which was probably inevitable considering the film that it was following. But now it has people who, you know, some people who actually like it more than the first one. Yeah, no, I know it's, it has definitely come into its own. Well, it probably helps that it's that there's been other sequels and now remakes as well. Right. And, you know, it does actually stand out as quite a unique piece. You know, it's truly a uh, beautiful cinematic work. There's a cinematic style to it that makes it appealing. You fucked up again! You fucked up again! He says, hey, it's so slow. Legal media! Of course, we're just elect side. Ah! Half hour, a valuable kill time wasted, running down them coked up pretzel necks, and not a good chop on the whole bunch. I pick the middle skip. I see nobody but Bubba, you whole wicked what? chop tested again, huh? Get your boots! They may support me. Fuck you, idiot, you bolted head. Bald, you both bitch. It's kind of the thing I've wanted and have been doing recently with film, taking it into a kind of almost opera. You know, I'm not talking about character singing, but I'm talking about a dramatic scenario that is traveling in your mind to process with music that helps the aperture expand. I was trying quite a few stylistic things in this, and my director friends totally appreciated this film in its day and um, you, you would be surprised of uh, the, the names that I could mention that this is their favorite film mm -hmm. or then again maybe you wouldn't be surprised <laughs> bring it on out bring it on out bury the devil <laughs> So what about these three actors acting together? Did they did they have a good dynamic amongst each other as the family? You know, did it just kind of spiral into this crazy yeah. Thanksgiving dinner of a scene? Yeah, yes, they did. Yes, yes. Paul business man gets into the ass every time. Right, this junk. Quit, dump this cook show. Sell off this turkey. It's time. It's in the air. It's what the public wants. I don't want to hear that again. There's a, a, a little spark that happens here. <laughs> that spark that, that? Uh, of uh, Z16s you just saw. Af after this take, after I called cut, that whole back wall turned into flames back there. And we almost lost the set. And the, boy, the crew was pitching in, pulling, uh, you know, pulling uh, those bags, those uh, burlap bags that covers the wall, and well, everyone pitched in. The fire department was there really quickly. Go look at it. Get your butt moving, boy. Go up there and look at it. Go look at it. Uh, 
Now, okay. Jim, being the more experienced actor of uh, of these three, am I right in saying that he was the, he, he'd probably the, done more work in acting than the other two? Probably guys. so. Did they kind of look up to him as uh, as the guy to lead the way that uh, the family would interact? If not, they should have. You know, it would have been the way for them to go. I mean, I was quite in there as the 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 father of of a lot of. <laughs> Of a lot of this madness. Madness, yeah. Big crazy booger. Let's all butt through. is Franklin which is another thing that brings us back to yeah yeah to that Franklin. to the backstory the subtext of somehow it seems like Franklin's skeleton would have been <laughs> never mind <laughs> <laughs> what, a little bigger <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you got that <laughs> but then that isn't the way it works right no. I mean nature breaks things down I'm here now in its own way. I'm here now. They can't do this. They can't do this. Yes, those extra chainsaw chains hanging on his <laughs> shop tops utility belt had some really interesting things in it from uh, Harpo Marx kind of bicycle horns. I'll take you back to hell. I'll take you to hell. did an extraordinary job on the original film. I, I mean, some of his bone creations were like, you, you, well, I saw one at Sotheby's, actually in a, in a catalog. Uh, they were selling it, one of the, one of the mass. <laughs> Create and you know all of these designs. I mean this cyclorama, panorama thing of, of of corpses at the beach and this and that. I mean those people cutting bones with uh, bandsaws and 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 bones too because there, there were so many uh, so many skeletons needed. I found out that to buy a uh, purchase real skeletons were uh, less expensive than plastic ones. Oh, is that right? So where do you get so many real skeletons? Uh, India is the only place that, that you can legally buy skeletons from. I don't know why that is. It's interesting. They cost a, a little more a full-grown skeleton with uh, perfect teeth or a little more expensive. <laughs> <laughs> That's very interesting. It, it is. I mean, you, you, know, you know, it brings up like, you know, how, uh, under those conditions, how would you, I mean, where would you get an adult skeleton with perfect teeth? Almost at a film uh, after that realization called Skeleton Farm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what would it? What would that have been? About? Well, it would have been about the the pampering and of a culture pampering a uh, 
almost like Kobe beef, you know? I mean, really protecting the animal, taking good care, dental work, make sure the, the brushing is done, make sure it grows up just properly, no broken bones, you know? We have the best skeletons uh, f for any uh, pharmaceutical company or any school um, anatomy class in the business. <laughs> Luckily, you didn't need uh, skeletons with perfect teeth. No, so no, no. It came in under budget on <laughs> skeletons. Are you the saboteur that's fucking up our house? <laughs> Trying to put me out of business? Thousands of dollars lost. You got that kind of money? No. It's the DJ, my fame. <laughs> that dirty thing told me you boys got her. Well, yeah. Letterface killed her once already tonight. But look, she's red faced. The Bubba's been playing with her. Bubba likes her. Bubba's got a girlfriend. 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 Is that what this is, Bubba? The old cock and cut swindle, huh? Did you really want to give uh, Bubba uh, a bit more personality uh, th than he had in the first one then? Did you, is that what you wanted to explore? There was no avoiding that. I mean, you know, looking at this, you, you know, Bubba had to, um, he had to respond uh, in kind and, uh, and behave uh, appropriate to the situation that he was in now. So it was a little, you know, it was just more in your face. Usually the uh, antagonistic character you don't get to know as well as this, you know, un unless it's under these conditions, being um, a kind of comedy. That isn't really what this is, but and I'm trying to figure out what exactly genre this this would be. Well, it's certainly a precursor to the... Uh extreme horror comedy of the likes of House of a Thousand Corpses. And, yes. You know, there's comedy in that film as well. Yes. Very reminiscent of this. Finish her now! Finish her now, Baba! Finish her! Finish her! Give me that! Turn traitor for a piece of tail. You got one choice, boy! Sex or the saw? Sex is, well... Nobody knows. But the saw, the saw is family. <laughs> it's family. Wait till granddad hears about this. Take her away. Why would you give him the name Bubba uh, when, uh, you know, even the characters refer to him as Leatherface in the original? I don't know. But, you know, these are memories from details from long ago. Yeah. And it was probably someone's name was Bubba. When I was in Texas doing the, the documentary, I mean, <laughs> yeah. there was there was a lot of people telling me that Bubba is uh, you know is very specific to it, Texas, it, and it, a very specific name for a specific kind of person. It, it is, yeah. And of course, we're starting the dinner scene now, and uh, the dinner scene is similar to the dinner scene in in the original. In the, uh -huh, yeah. And the dinner scene has also uh, occurred in both of the sequels to this, part three and part four. Why do you think, as a, a third act narrative uh, structure, that it keeps on being reused in the Chainsaw films? The films I didn't direct uh, or write, I don't know, but central to the. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the family, uh, is, is, of course, uh, dinner scenes, uh, or dinner. And as, as I recall, um, you know, as a young boy uh, growing up in Texas, dinner time, especially if it's a, a large family occasion, was the place that you could get in more trouble with your family. I mean, it's, it's kind of where resentment and all kind of things spark up out of dinner time that is in in a world that I have observed.
And bringing the girl home for dinner to meet the family yeah, yeah, as well, of course. Yes, yes. There's something about that, you know, sitting around a campfire, sharing and um, eating and bring something interesting out. Grandpa's strict liquid diet keeps him as fresh as a rose. Every spring, the Atlas Rendering Company used to throw a big barbecue for Grandpa. Oh, he was the master. Dirk. He was the one and only. He showed us all the business. We bring Grandpa out here as well. Oh, grand Grandpa's got to kill yeah. How is Grandpa still alive at this point? Oh, Grandpa, well, well, he'll tell you. He'll, it, it says fresh liquid diet. They make sure uh, gr Grandpa has the proper colonic treatments and <laughs> such as that. <laughs> Those old guys... Uh, the old blood drinkers, you know, I'm talking about the people in the s slaughter business, uh, you know, where blood sausage came from, things like that. I mean, they, they, you know, they'd live a long time. I mean, that was the story, you know, that these, these blood drinkers would live uh, longer. Mm -hmm. There's Grandpa to testify to this. One morning, Grandpa just quit going in. It was the shame. It was the shame. The shame. Well, there's more work to do. Let's get on with it. Great, let's, let's get on with it. Bingo! Yeah, get that tub over there in a hurry. Do I have to do every damn thing around here? <laughs> you just... <laughs> Bubba, she's ready. Bring her on down. Were you approached to do any of the other ones after this, or did you want to take a step away after this one? Oh, I, wa I, I wanted to t take a step away after this. But you were involved in the remake to an extent, weren't you? Yeah, yes, but, but uh, you know, in production. Let me go! Let me go, please help me! Yeah, this will be one please you help won't me. forget. It's a real honor. <laughs> Grandpa, he's a one-hitter. <laughs> and it's... Just like going home. I got no, 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 loved in, uh, in the original film, too, and uh, Jim Seedow totally understood this uh, schizophrenic kind of thing that he was doing between uh, this being something that he's enjoying and then he pulls back and decides, no, that this is wrong for him to be enjoying things such as this, and then he'll kind of reprimand himself. He doesn't do that so much in this one, though, does he? He's, he's more kind of just entered the... The he, deranged phase. He, well, he did, he did just a moment ago at the table, bring her on down, boy, and he looks around, he kind of skitzes himself. Uh, but no, not 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 as uh, not in the way he did in the uh, the original. He, uh, he he's come to terms with this by now. See, by chainsaw too. He's hey, the character. Grandpa, here's the big boy. Uh, look what Bubba brought you. <laughs> hey, hey, Grandpa, Bubba's got something to show you here. Look, a slurpy <laughs> booty. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Eat her, Grandpa. Okay, come on, Grandpa. Let's see you do it. Come on, Grandpa. Eat her. You're, you're the best. Eat her, Grandpa. Come on. Eat her, Grandpa. Come on. Jim, remember those bees? Come on. One hitter, Bob. Come eat her, on, Grandpa. Grandpa. Come on, you're the best. Sometime after the original film, it, uh, capturing video and having it in, and being able to play movies back all the time. 80? It was early 80s, wasn't it? Uh, it was early 80s, yeah. And until then, you know, we, we, we took it home as a memory and couldn't break it down and study it. Do you think that's better or, or worse? Oh, no, it's, no, I think it's good. If you want to see the construction of a film, it's, uh, it's good. I, and, and it's very good that uh, there's home theater and 16 by 9 and DVD and 5.1.
that grandma we saw at the table before as well? No, no, that's Nubbins. Oh, that was Nubbins. That's Nubbins, yeah. Okay. Yeah, grandma's, uh, grandma's up in uh, Chainsaw Heaven right now. You, you know, you'll hear him say it, and that's up at the, you know, the top of the Matterhorn. That's what the... Uh, of course, yeah. I, I the saw the shrine. Paramount logo on this. And, you know, that's the, the end of the movie is, uh, yeah, is Caroline up in the... That's right, up with Grandma in a big kind of bone shrine. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah, and Chainsaw Heaven. <laughs> <laughs> When Dennis uh, jumps down from this distance, it's a thing called a swap off gag. You'll see him jump, and then uh, and then you'll see him recover from the jump and walk into a, a close up, and it's uh, like that's a stunt man. Then down under the frame is Dennis. Then he boys, comes up. Boys, boys, what the hell's going on here? That the American way of entering a man's home, singing like that. I think that's an important line for some reason. <laughs> Boys, you never should have been doing this. Who sent you? Those sissies over at Delmar Catering? Were you involved in the Check music in this one? So yes, you were in the original. Yeah. So you actually, but you actually did a pretty major score for this film, whereas it was more noises uh, first time around. Yeah, it, it was, um, uh, you know, more synthesizer samples but wayne bell did work on this film well, it? wayne bell was the uh, sound uh, production mixer on this which means he was behind the nagra and capturing all this dialogue wayne is quite possibly one of the best production mixers in in the business wayne really understands uh, sound and good sound and I remember at the time mixing the film that all the mixers were blown away with uh, the quality of production sound. Very little ADR in this. Lefty. Sister. Lefty. It's not relevant to this film, but can you explain, speaking of Wayne Bell, can you explain how you did the noise at the beginning of the of the first film which goes Wing. Yeah, that noise <laughs> uh, if i t if if i told you wayne i can't really tell you without wayne's permission oh fair enough b because you know he he and i are you're going to keep that a secret yeah something should be a secret <laughs> and it, it's out there anyway Pete. yeah Can you talk about the choreography of the chainsaw scene here? Is it mainly stunt men? And yeah, it's back and forth between you know between stunts and the principal players. There there are a couple of scenes in here that you're looking at the stunt man's face and not lefty and right, and it's just happening so quickly that you don't notice. <laughs> didn't actually have blades on the chainsaw here. The, no, had the, the spiraling chain, but, uh, but we'd taken the teeth off. <laughs> so these are truly elaborate sets. The um, production design team just... Uh, yeah, there's nothing's mm -hmm. having dinner. And, and, and his big red, I forgot... Uh, about big reds what's that well that's that drink he had the, the the straw going into that bottle of of, of red fluid red soda pop that is some kind of berry or big red and uh and, and those big round i think they call them moon pies or something like that mm -hmm. in the south 
I have no idea. I think I think it's manufactured though in Texas. Well, it's nice that they keep him as a part of the family. I noticed chopped up earlier. Uh, sc- uh, did the uh, coat hanger thing with his own head and then did it to nubbins. Oh, he well. did that. Uh, yeah, that's right. Doesn't matter. That Anthropomorphism. He's been dead for years, yeah, right. <laughs> he's he's putting as much life into to nubbins as he can. He's sharing what he can. Yeah. <laughs> How did you do this? Uh, oh, okay. It, it, well, it was like, a, you know, an arrow through the head gag. The chainsaw went in, and then the off-camera side, cables went around to the fitting. I mean, it was like a body harness, and then cables went around and operated the saw on the other side. Fuck you, Charlie. Huh? Let me take a look. Yeah, so it would have been mounted on the... Now that went entirely around. That's part of a bodysuit. So it would, have, it, was a, it would have been a brace that went around the entire waist. And was it important to you to actually kill off the family in this one so this would be the end? You mean what I was thinking then? I yeah, I mean, I know. I mean, it basically blows up and, let's face it, the cook... Leatherface and Grandpa are going to be dead. Yeah. Well, there must have been something like that going on. And nubbins. Yeah, and, uh, and nubbins. Yeah, nubbins and shreds. Not this time. Would you say that this is your most outrageous film? Probably so, yeah. I think I'm definitely going to return to this uh, outrageous kind of theater. I am working on something that's uh, totally outrageous. This is reminiscent as well of the original where it basically breaks out of the mayhem into the daytime. Into, into the daytime, for the, yeah. For the final showdown. Yeah, and it has that big time chainsaw dance at the end, only now it's a uh, stretch. Exactly. You could be suggesting that she could be starting the next uh, generation of the family. Uh, absolutely. And, uh, you know, it also shows the uh, strength of uh, women as the first film did. first film had you had a, a surviving female at the end which became the way all uh, horror movies in the late 70s and 80s were there would be the surviving female who, who beats the monster I can't think of any any horror films that did that before Chainsaw I can't either <laughs> So here she's no longer just being kept upstairs. She's actually in chains or heaven. Yeah, she's, she's, so she's, she's definitely, yeah, she's shrined out. And uh, She's bloated a bit. <laughs> yes, she did, didn't she? Well, you know, I mean, that's what that kind of respect does. <laughs> she has a family that loves her. Oh, yeah, yeah. I did a film a few years ago where the, the actual this, this the stuntman playing uh, 
uh, Bill here. I shot him out of a cannon or something, and he reminded me, he told me that he did some of the gags on this. Mm-hmm. That's an incredible work of art. That uh, Bang my bow. Yeah. Yeah. Fun. My face. Look! It's like death eating a cracker, isn't it? Huh? She's she's cornered and she'll take whatever action it takes to survive or yeah. not. You know, I mean, she's committed. Well, she's also about to crack a bit, like Sally does at the end. I yeah. mean, if you go for a night like that, it's going to take it out. Of you. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think it would. Yes. of the first one. Yeah, you know, the cutting up at the back, yeah. Cutting the back with the razor, yeah. Brotherly trait. Yeah. And he goes right down there, yeah. Uh, right back down to the chute, right back down into... To join the family. To, yeah, to join the family, yes. How did you get this shot? <laughs> Just uh, with a, uh, uh, a long lens from a good distance. What is it about Texas that you think lends itself to having characters like this? You know, I mean lost in the middle of nowhere well it's I do, you, you know that's it's 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 a big state <laughs> that, that would that would be a very good question for Kit Carson yeah <laughs> <laughs> but you'd lived in Texas for a good part of your life as well though didn't you no not a good part of my life I, I lived there quite a long time I think I was still in my late teens maybe when I started the move to California right and um, yeah, you know, Murphy beds. At the <laughs> living at a place with uh, uh, that Max Sennett used to uh, used to live at um, the Garden Court Apartments. It's still the suite still had Murphy beds. You know that you pull down from you know the gag beds that yeah. you get closed up in and you never come out. Back home, you got a loving wife. She can't hear you calling out here. You know, I can't say enough actually about how I appreciate everyone pitching in on this film the way they did and uh, and giving it all mm-hmm. and, and they did you know I mean it was just film fanatics doing doing what we do Dick Curris did an incredible job of uh, DPing this film Curris and I go way way back I, I, I dare say Curris wouldn't even know. Had you worked with Curris before in a, a director DP capacity, or you just knew each other? We just knew each other, and he taught at, at one time at UT, taught film. I don't know, we, we were just like friends, even before my uh, student film, and before the heisters, and way back. Back now, you haven't seen it in a couple of years. How do you how do you rate Chainsaw Two in your canon of films? Oh, it's it's way up there. I, I very much like this movie. You you basically obviously made a big splash with with the first film, a film that's never going to be forgotten. Are you a fan of the genre, or did you kind of fall into it because of that? Are you happy to be associated with the horror genre? No, oh, yes, I am. Yeah, and and yes, I'm a fan of the genre. 
And so far as the original uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it it, it was, uh, you know, one one of those gifts. I think. Yeah, yeah. I'm a fan of thrillers, suspense. Also, I'm a fan of uh, epic films and uh, films such as Night of the Iguana and you know John Huston and Polanski films, Chinatown. If if I covered all my bases there, or not <laughs> let me know. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>